reading today is from Luke chapter 19, verse 20 through 40, 29 through 40. When he came home near Bethpage and Bethany at the place called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of the disciples saying, go into the village ahead of you. And as you enter it, you will find tied there a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Just say this, the Lord needs it. So those who were sent departed and found it as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, why are you untying the colt? They said, the Lord needs it. Then they brought it to Jesus. And after, their thro- after throwing their coat, cloaks to the colt, they set Jesus on it. As he rode along, people kept spreading their cloaks on the road. As he was now approaching the path down from the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to praise God joyfully with a loud voice and for all deeds of power they had been seen, saying, Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest heaven. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, order your disciples to stop. He answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the stones would shout out. Before I read our second scripture reading, please pray with me. Holy God, spirit of life, our strength comes from your love and our hope is in your grace. Prepare our minds and open our hearts to receive and believe your word to us. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Our second scripture reading is from the letter to the Philippians. It's from chapter 2, verses 5 through 11. Listen for what the Spirit may be saying to you today and saying to our church. Paul writes, Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness, and being found in human form, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God also highly exalted him, And gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bend, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I invite you once again to bring your Bible imagination. I love the imagination of our younger church. But bring your own Bible imagination and come with me to first century Palestine, to a location just east east of Jerusalem, to the little towns of Bethpage and Bethany, where Mary and Martha are from, and imagine that spring has returned, the fields are turning green, there are wildflowers in the desert, and thousands of people are going to Jerusalem the capital city, the place where you want to experience the Passover as often as you can. Pontius Pilate, the prefect or governor of Judea, who rules under Tiberius Caesar, the ruler of the Roman Empire, is also coming to Jerusalem because you need to be there with your soldier forces and your authority when there's going to be that many people, thousands and thousands of people in the city. And he comes with a glorious parade. We can read about this in the history books. When somebody like that came to town, he came with a glorious parade. He came on a big horse with armor. He came with soldiers before him, beside him, behind him, with lots of drums and gold and silver on the horses and on him. Music, people cheering, The streets filled with people. Have you ever seen a famous person go by? I've once or twice seen somebody famous come by where you cheer for them. That is what it was like. But when we open God's word, Luke and the other gospel writers too 
have a different view of what's important. And they take us to a different view of what's going on in Jerusalem that day. A small group of people led by a teacher who is very dynamic, very loving, and can heal people are making plans for their day to go into Jerusalem. And so the teacher asks two of the students to take on a very humble and actually quite daring task. They are sent to fetch a donkey, a young one, one that has never been ridden. And Jesus says, go, go in the village. There'll be a donkey there. Just take the donkey. So maybe Luke leaves out part of the conversation. Well, we can't just take the donkey. And Jesus says, it's, it'll be okay if anyone asks. Just say, the master needs it. Well, everything goes exactly according to plan. Did you notice? No, no one writes anything other than they got the donkey. They said, the master needs it. And it was a-okay. So they come back with the donkey. And the people with Jesus take their clothing, their top cloak or their extra clothing and we know from scripture they didn't have a lot of clothing they weren't allowed to bring a lot of stuff with them so they take something very precious and they put it on the donkey and he gets on the donkey as they begin to lead the donkey as if there's a divine choreographer as if there's a cue from heaven a crowd starts forming a parade starts happening and people are taking their precious extra garments and throwing them down on the ground, on the stones, along with palm branches, according to other Gospels, so that the donkey can walk on something, on the stones, so that Jesus can be led through town or into town like an honored guest. So imagine these two different images of what the world found important and what the gospel writers found important and what the Lord wants us to see as important. And a loud group of women, men, and children are gathering, and they are not only throwing things down, but they are waving the palms, and they are yelling out, and they are praising God. Imagine now who they are. To the 12 closest disciples, the women who we know went with them and provided for them out of their own resources, including Jesus' mother, the blind now seeing, the, parallel, the paralyzed now walking, the hopeless now with hope, the lepers now clean, the people that have been moved by his teaching who are changing their lives. And there is a prophecy about this. There's a prophecy about this, and Jesus is channeling that prophecy on purpose. There seems to be no doubt about that by the gospel writers. And the disciples would have known the prophecy. And the prophecy is from Zechariah 9.9, and it goes like this. Rejoice greatly, O daughter Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter Jerusalem. Lo, your king comes to you. Triumphant and victorious is he, humble and riding on a donkey, on a colt the foal of a donkey. So that kind of gives me chills. I don't know about you. Sort of like heaven is queuing up exactly what is happening. And so I wonder if you were his closest disciples now, if you were the women who traveled and provided out of their own resources, if you were the lepers leaping and the blind seeing, how would you picture the next week to go? How would you picture what happens when he comes into Jerusalem? What would you have hoped would happen? What would you have dreamed vividly? Well, Jesus has told them at least three times in Scripture recorded, and probably more, that when he gets to Jerusalem, he's going to suffer and die. They never believe it. Never once do they buy it. Do they think he's exaggerating? Do they think he's just being pessimistic? Do they think he's maybe talking in code? They used to argue about who was the greatest. Remember that? They would always be arguing, who's the greatest? I'm the greatest. Who's going to get to sit by you, Jesus, when you come into your kingdom? Who's going to get to sit next to your throne? James and John, 
James and John's mother even reinforced it. Can James and John sit by you when you're on your throne, when you come into Jerusalem? You're the Messiah, right? The parade continues. People are excited. Don't you think his disciples are excited? Now maybe they are going to figure out who's going to sit by the throne. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven. Glory in the highest heaven. Over and over. Voices chanting. When you're cheering for someone, you say the same thing over and over. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. The Pharisees. God bless them. They mean well. They really do. They are protective of the capital city. They are protective of the people who live there. They, are, they even seem protective of Jesus, and they warn urgently, tell your disciples to stop. Jesus, tell them to be quiet. Well, this is a huge turning point, I believe, in the story, and the most important turning point to start Holy Week. And I want to focus the last few minutes of this message on what that turning point means. Have you ever had a time in your life where you said to yourself, that was God's plan, I didn't realize it at the time, but I realize it now? In fact, I resisted it at the time, but I appreciate it now, and I could never have thought of something so good as what happened. For me, this Palm Sunday parade is one of those times. God's plan is about to unfold. To love that we can never imagine, that we could never do. For sacrifice that we really, I still cannot fathom, I can't understand, and I honestly can hardly think think of it or dwell on it. Jesus' hour has come. The child of Bethlehem has grown up. He's become a man. And as so beautifully told in that Philippians passage I read, which was an early hymn of the church, he didn't for one hour take the status of God. He took the form of a servant who knew his purpose, and he would stop at nothing. Nothing was going to stop. He would never say no. You know, he could have taught his disciples how to fight instead of how to love. He could have stopped the soldiers from hurting him. He could have stopped and not gone on the cross. He could have destroyed his enemies with one word, but his one word was forgive. Forgive. Teacher, tell your disciples to stop. Seems to imply that if the parade was dispersed, if the people went home, then the plan could be canceled. The Pharisees say, let's not get everybody all worked up. Let's not make this into something dangerous. But the Pharisees' pleading has no effect. This is what I see in this passage. Their pleading, which may be our pleading, has no effect. Because Jesus says, I tell you, if every single one here stopped talking, it would not change God's mind. The stones would shout out. So when I read that, and when I got Matthew his stone, um, yes, I realized that a stone never talks. Um, You might hear some wind whistling past the stones, but the stones never talk. Back in 1975, there was a man who, in a bar, thought of an idea of a pet rock. (laughs) He was talking with some friends about pets that are too much trouble, and he invented the pet rock and he sold a million of them for $3.95 each and became a millionaire. But the irony is that rocks and stones don't do anything. And that's the irony of Jesus' statement. If these were quiet, the stones would cry out. Communicates the Pharisees don't get it. Even if the praise stops completely, which it will... Even if the disciples abandon him, which they will, even if the Roman soldiers nail him to a cross, which they will, heaven and nature will sing. 
You know that line from Joy to the World? Let heaven and nature sing, because God is faithful. Amen. The disciples' plans are, frankly, too small. They're really embarrassing. They want to sit on a, next to a throne and rule people. They want to wear some fancy clothes for a change instead of that one tunic. Jesus said so often to them, death is the way to life. That is how God lifts us up through the death of Christ and our death to ourselves and our little plans. And through praising God for God's big plans that are so great that we can never imagine. So, as we fast from our own little plans and being served in our plans, I suggest we make this a week of praise. Praise, like on Palm Sunday. Praise like the stones would do. Luke says that the multitude were praising that day for the deeds of power they had seen in Jesus. And that's what I invite us to do. An attitude of praise for the times when small provisions were enough. When it didn't seem like enough, and it was enough in God's hands. When nature took our breath away. When we were hurt and discouraged, and Jesus was with us. When we were prejudiced or negative, and our eyes were opened. Praise for when mercy was God's answer to our mistakes. Praise for when we were chosen for a task that was, seemed dumb and maybe embarrassing, but was exactly what was needed at that time, like the donkey fetchers. Praise for when God said no, and it turned out God was right. And finally, praise for when we surrendered to God's gift of grace as a free gift. We simply say, oh, I accept that I'm accepted. So if the rest of this day and the last week of Holy, this last week of Lent, let's make praise what's on our lips. Forget the plans for a week. Simply praise. Come Holy Spirit, be with us. Amen.